Good evening, folks, and a hearty welcome to our drive-in theater. We have a wonderful evening's entertainment lined up for you, one that will provide several hours of pleasurable relaxation and diversion for you and your family. Did you fail to dress up for tonight's show? No tie, an old shirt and slacks, a house dress? Well, don't give it a thought. We're glad you came as you are. We just want you to enjoy yourselves. Don't forget to visit our refreshment center during the intermission or any time. You love the tasty array of snacks we have to offer. So will the youngsters. Everything is quality and mm, so good. We hope you'll make this a weekly visit. Bring the family. Bring your friends. There are always wonderful new pictures to see, delightful snacks to nibble, a gay, pleasant evening for all. Oh, a word of caution. Don't drive over 10 miles an hour in the theater area for your safety's sake. And mom or pop, go with the kids when they leave the car. We hope you have a wonderful time. Come back soon. Tobor, the most amazing, the most fantastic creation of man's mind. Oh, he looks alive. For Tobor can live where no human can breathe, in the airless atmosphere of outer space. And the nation first to conquer space controls the world. Electronic scientists have designed a practical spaceship. Atomic power makes space travel possible, needing only the most valuable of all secret scientific achievements. Space conquering giants that man can control. Tobor is alive. For even though much work remains before he's completed, he is already a sentient being, a necessary adjunct to the recording of all experiences our human space crews may later encounter. Since we cannot get in to see Nordstrom's secrets for ourselves, we must induce him to come out and tell them to us. They have no news of Professor Nordstrom or the boy. Neither has the Los Angeles Police Department nor the FBI. I take it you want the formulae for my extrasensory transmission method. Gramps, don't you tell him! Don't you do it! Please, don't you tell him! No, Gramps, don't! All right! You win. Tobor bringing you chills you've never known before. Tobor, the most human outer space man ever seen on Earth. Be sure to see Tobor. Annihilation of man. Annihilation? The beginning of the end. A menace so massive, so overwhelming, that thousands upon thousands are propelled into senseless terror. Panic takes the place of planned evacuation, and whole cities are paralyzed by fear. The Air Force is standing by with an atom bomb. You can't drop an atom bomb on Chicago. <laughs>
Saturdays, Gumby used toy robots to do his chores so that he and his pal, Pokey, could relax. But on this day, something unexpected happened. Mother, may we both have a glass of milk? You certainly may. Are you getting your work done all right? Look out the window, Mother! Well, I declare, that was a clever idea. But remember to return the robots when you're through with them. Sure, Mother! Such clever boys certainly deserve some crackers with their milk. Gumby, look! <gasps> Gumby? I want you to... Oh, help! Help, Gumbo! Fire department. Oh, right away, dear. Right, dear? You came just in time. quickly. Look, Gumby, your father didn't stop that one. Uh-oh. Oh, Gumbo, look at my flower bed. Way to stop that robot now.
And now, on with the show. future, but not the very distant future. It is a story that might have taken place the day after tomorrow. Like all stories of the future, however, its beginnings lie far back in the past, as far back as the first man on earth to gaze at the stars and wonder if someday, somehow, he might travel to them. Travel through space. In the years following the Second World War, two basic patterns began to influence the growing science of space travel. Rockets or guided missiles grew larger and larger. Atomic power plants grew smaller and smaller compact enough to be contained in a submarine, finally in a rocket ship. Immediately, by special order of the president, a new agency was formed, CIFC, Civil Interplanetary Flight Commission. So, with almost unlimited funds voted by Congress, this commission began its task, research in new fissionable materials more research in non-fissionable metallic alloys to make rocket tubes that would not be melted like wax by their own atomic blasts. Sometimes mishaps occurred. And men paid for them with their lives. But the work went on. Experiments in celestial navigation. Astrophysics. Aerodynamics. Until finally, only one obstacle remained. That, as our story begins, turned out to be the oldest obstacle in the history of mankind. The human factor.
Slower. Slower. Really, Dr. Harrison, this is intolerable. Dan. Dan, are you all right? Dan, snap out of it! Yeah, Doc. Yeah. Dan, how do you feel? Okay? Yeah, I guess so. Must have blocked out. Sit tight and take it easy. Now get him out of there and over to the hospital. You see, Doctor, he wasn't in any real danger. Under other forms of government, men are deliberately killed or crippled every day in experiments like this. Well, I won't stand by and see manslaughter become policy here. I resent that implication. These men are volunteers. It's too bad. The commissioner was most anxious to have this test carried out to the extreme so that he could discuss the results with Professor Nordstrom. Well, you can tell the commissioner and Professor Nordstrom. Never mind, I'll tell him myself. office. Oh, good morning, General. Yes, Professor Nordstrom's with the Commissioner now. No, I'm sorry. Dr. Harrison, what's the matter? I want to see the Commissioner. I'm sorry, he's with Professor Nordstrom. Uh, Miss Pickett, copies, please, for Professor Nordstrom, please. I want to see you. In just a few minutes, Harrison. I can't talk to you at the moment. You don't have to. Just listen. I resign as of now. Harrison, what in the world's wrong with you? I told you once before that I'm not going to stand by anymore and watch human beings being turned into guinea pigs. My dear Harrison, the uncovering of knowledge must always involve risk for pioneers. Fortunately, there are always men and women ready to take those risks. Now, you know that as well as I do. That's not the point, and you know it. We shouldn't even be considering the use of test pilots in this first experimental ship. It's not only inhuman, it's unscientific and unintelligent. That's quite enough. We'll resume this discussion later on. Why, you are in a state. There's my pass. Staff card and a badge. You can send my papers down to the hotel. Just a moment, Doctor. You can't leave the building without your exit pass, you know. I'm concerned you can stay there. Well, hold on, Doc. All I want to know is what's going on between you and Professor Nordstrom. Nothing. Yes? This is the Washington Globe, Dr. Harrison. We're trying to contact Professor Nordstrom. Look, if this is a gag, it's not very funny. I've never even met Professor Nordstrom, and there's no reason to suppose that I ever will. Dr. Harrison? Yes. Are you by any chance going to talk to me about Professor Nordstrom? Why, yes, in a way. Well, let me tell you this. A, he isn't here. B, I don't know where he is. C, I've never met him. And D, I don't want to. Three misstatements out of four, Doctor. That's a bad average for a man of science. You see, I am Professor Nordstrom, and I'm very glad to meet you at last. You are? Yeah. Why? Because I've followed your career with interest, and uh, we see eye to eye on a subject with which I'm particularly concerned. We do? I don't get it. Well... Uh, Perhaps a little more seclusion might be a good idea. You mind if I make myself comfortable? No. Go ahead. Well, the fact is, Doctor, I overheard your little interview with the CIFC director this morning. As I just spent an hour telling him exactly what you told him so much more cogently in a couple of minutes, I was, well, interested to say the least. You mean to tell me that you think they're wrong in trying to use human beings? I know they're wrong. Before we can prepare men for the conditions they're going to meet in extraterrestrial space, we've got to know what those conditions are. Not guess, but know. That's what I've been telling them all along. But the problem of getting there and back to collect accurate data without the use of human pilots and observers is going to be a backbreaker. On the contrary, I can almost say now that I have it solved. With your collaboration, I think I can convert that almost into an unqualified fact. Your attention, please. Your attention, please. Skyliner flight number one for Los Angeles will board at South Concourse, gate number five, in 15 minutes. So we can start work the moment we arrive. 
without all of those coils of red tape hampering us all the time. Yes, I know what you mean. I suppose that sprang from the secret nature of the project in the first place. Top secret. <laughs> Someday before I'm too old, I look forward to working on a job where I don't have to burden the contents of my wastebasket every night. You never can tell who might be hiding in a wastebasket. Don't tell me you're a security regulations quarter too, my boy. <laughs> okay. You were saying you'd be able to show me what you're working on as soon as we arrive. I have to. Every minute counts now, because we have to perfect my innovation before the commission is ready to send out his first ship. Now, if we do... Well, well, if it isn't Professor Nordstrom. I don't know whether you remember me or not. Uh, Gilligan, science editor of Transglobal News Service. You'll have to forgive me, Mr. Gilligan, but I've met so many journalists here in Washington. All you scientists are supposed to be absent-minded. Me, I'm trained never to forget a face. I'm afraid we're talking shop, Gilligan. That's what I figured. You're Harrison, aren't you? Of the Civil Interplanetary Flight Commission. No comment. Well, you were until you quit this morning. And what was that all about, Doctor? No comment. You two being together here at the airport, is this anything to do with the trouble you've had with the Commission, Professor? I'm afraid I have no comment for that either. Now, why don't you leave us both alone? Oh, take it easy, Doc. Never can tell what kind of a story will gel when you big brains huddle together. Uh, like the one your syndicate released prematurely about the hydrogen bomb drops in the Pacific or the atomic aircraft carrier engine. Look, you're in the business of smashing atoms. I'm in the business of selling newspapers. If Uncle Sam doesn't know how to keep his own secrets, that's his tough luck. It doesn't matter how much aid or comfort you give our potential enemies or how many of our side eventually get killed. Hold it, Ralph. Now listen, Mr. Gilliam. You listen to me, Professor. You fellows can't go on dummying up like this indefinitely. Sooner or later, you've got to talk for the record. Look at it this way. The prospect of space travel in the immediate future is the biggest news story in the country today. Years and years of research, millions and millions of taxpayers' dollars have been spent building that first spaceship. Now, when it's just about ready to take off, what happens? One of the greatest scientific minds in the world, that's you, comes out and disagrees about how the ship's to be worked. I was about to say, Mr. Gilligan, I'd be willing to make a statement. I don't want a statement. I want facts. It's no secret in Washington that the row was over your not wanting to use men on the first space trip. What the people of the United States want to know is what you propose using instead. If I were prepared with the facts you're talking about now, I'd tell you. Only right now, I'm not. However, I will tell you this. Just 30 days from now, at my home in California, Dr. Harris and I will tell all or at least as much as circumstances at that time will allow. I'll be there, Professor. So will the science editors of, say, 11 other press services. Well, I thought this was an exclusive. It ought to be. Do the people of the United States read only trans-global news releases, Mr. Gilligan? Your attention, please. Skyliner, flight number one for Los Angeles, now boarding at South Concourse, gate number five. That's our call, Professor. I'll uh, see you in California, Mr. Gilligan. Okay, okay. Skyliner, flight number one for Los Angeles. Now boarding at South Concourse, gate number five. <laughs> The car runs good. This is my own invention. A combination of sonic beam and photoelectric cells. The chance of anyone else hitting on the same coat of lights and sound impulses is practically non-existent. I have a whole series throughout my premises. You sound as proud of them as if they'd won the Nobel. <laughs>
darling. Dad, it's so good to see you. This is Dr. Harrison, Janice, my new colleague, my daughter, Mrs. Roberts, who runs this household with a rod of iron. Dad, how do you do? How do you do? Gramps! Gramps! Jewel Kurzika here just in time. Come on in the house, Gramps. I got it all figured out. Can't, Brad, dear. Come on, I gotta show you. We got company. This is my grandson, Brian, better known as Gadge. He likes gadgets, too, perhaps too fondly. Dr. Harrison, who's going to work with me. How are you, Brian? Or may I call you Gadge? How do you do, sir? Come on, Gramps, I gotta show you. Come on. You'll have to excuse me. This sounds urgent. He's the grandson. The father of the boy was Katie Correa six, seven years ago. The boy is an imp of Satan. But what a brain. He'll be a greater man than his grandfather. Look, Graham, I told you I had it figured out. Only first I gotta make myself as tall as you are. Up until this moment, I thought I had invented the only burglar-proof lock, with only two people in the world, Carl and myself, sharing the secret of the combination. And how did you work it out, young man? Oh, logarithms. But I never went down the graphs, honest. Not without you around. Are you sure, Gadge? OK, Gadge. Come on, Ralph. As long as he has it open, I may as well show you what's down there. Can I come too, Gramps? No, my friend, you cannot. But I think it's time you were getting to school. I'm afraid it is, Gadge. What's the time? Time is now 21 and a half minutes past 8. OK, OK. Gimmicks. Always gimmicks. Let's get out of here. Wish I were down there with them. I wish I knew what Gramps was doing. I mean, this big job. Why won't he tell me? I guess it's just too important, Gadge. Nobody knows but Carl. And now this Harrison guy. Must be a pretty big job for him not to tell me. He What's never... What's that? Shh, listen. What is it? What is it? Are you sure you won't change your mind, Gramps? I'm sorry, Gadge. You know how much I'd like to have you down there tonight, but I just can't. But why? I know just as much about electronics and stuff as those old guys from the newspapers. They're not just old guys from the newspapers, Gadge. They're very distinguished scientific journalists representing the most important news services of the world. I will grant you this. You do know as much about electronics as they do. But I still don't see why. Well. Although you have a searching mind and the courage of a grown-up scientist, you look like just what you are, an 11-year-old boy. And I'm afraid that the people we've invited here tonight under such secrecy might not be adult enough to understand your presence here. That's why I have to pack you off to bed. I understand, Gramps. Good night. Thanks, Gadge. I guess I won't be needing this anymore. <laughs> well, I see no reason why you shouldn't hear what's going on. Gee, workers! Thanks, Gramps!
Go ahead. Hey, this is worse than crashing the Pentagon. When do we get in? When I've checked all the papers and written down all the numbers. in order. Thank you, my friend. Your place certainly has a lot of charm, Professor. It certainly does. It's an amazing location for a laboratory. How'd you ever find it? This old wine cellar was precisely the reason that I bought this place. It's ideal both for security and to protect our delicate equipment from surface vibrations. And now I think we'd better get started. Won't you be seated, gentlemen? Mind if I sit here? No, please do. As you know, gentlemen, it is my contention, as well as Dr. Harrison's, that to man the first experimental spaceship with a living crew is a useless and unwarranted risk of human life. The research program so far conducted by the Armed Forces and the Civil Interplanetary Flight Commission have been well planned and executed as far as they go. But they deal only with the easily deducible, obvious hazards of what we call space. Cosmic rays, disorientation, weightlessness, but they cannot guard against the unknown hazards. Without the results of actual observation and recording of data, no man can possibly know the conditions existing outside the atmospheric envelope of this Earth. He can only guess. And to me, the word guess cannot in any circumstances fit with the word science. Now, you say you must have the results of actual observation, yet you're opposed to sending human pilots to get them. Aren't you talking in contradictions, Professor? No, Mr. Gilligan, as you will see for yourself. Childish joke of mine. Robot spelled backwards. Well, since this is your invention, Professor Nordstrom, I, I suppose we can be sure this isn't just another movie Frankenstein. You certainly can. In fact, the term robot is hardly accurate in spite of my joke. I would prefer to say an electronic simulacrum of a man. Oh, gosh. Oh, gee willikers. Are you trying to tell us that this... This pile of tin could actually pilot a spaceship? Exactly. Now, you control this, this thing from that box by some sort of electronic wavelength or something, right? At the moment, I do, Mr. Johnson. Well, how do you know that the wavelength will be powerful enough to work outside the Earth's atmosphere? I don't, sir. But that doesn't matter very much because I'm not going to need them there. You see, Mr. Johnson, this control system is only a temporary expedient to activate Tobor during the early stages of his development.
From this point on, he will be guided by a totally different method. How about a little fill-in on that, Professor? You mean something new? Something we've never heard of? On the contrary, gentlemen. I'm sure most of you have heard of it. Although I imagine few of you will believe in it. ESP. Extrasensory perception. You mean that stuff about projecting thought images by telepathy? Mr. Gilligan, you're not too far off. In here, gentlemen, is the most intricate part of what I assure you is a highly sensitive mechanism. When that is activated, like this, an illusion, my dear, caused by reflected light in the eye tubes. And yet, in a way, Tovar is alive. For even though much work remains before he's completed, he is already a sentient being. The sentience may be synthetic, but is there nonetheless. A necessary adjunct to the recording of all experiences our human space crews may later encounter. A sentient being? You mean this... this thing can feel? Well, let me put it another way. Even in his present unfinished state, Tobor will react to emotional stimuli. Janice, help me with a little experiment, will you? Gentlemen, I assure you there's no collusion here. I'm merely going to ask Mrs. Roberts to approach Tobor and feel friendliness toward him. Think goodwill, as it were. You can do that, can't you, Janice? I'll try. All right, then go ahead. Just don't make any gestures. Just hold the friendship thought. He does look almost kind, doesn't he? Thank you, Janice. Could you get a reaction from some other emotion, Professor? And from a stranger? Say, from Johnston here. I think we could manage to do that. But why don't you make the experiment, Mr. Gilligan? Do you suppose you could contrive to feel enmity toward Tobor? Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, sure I could. Very well, then. Suppose you get up and uh, uh, take one of those fire axes from the wall. Now, if you will, walk around behind Tobor. And hold the thought of enmity all the time. Deadly enmity. the emotional stimulus was danger, the reaction fear, instantly followed by anger. You have just witnessed the complete cycle of a synthetic instinct, self-preservation. I have a question, Professor. Uh, now, you've persistently referred to the fact that this, uh, this robot... Tobor, Mr. Johnston. He'd better use his name or he might resent you. Oh, sorry. I'll rephrase that. Uh, why do you keep saying that Tobor is still incomplete? For the simple reason, Mr. Johnston, that we have not yet perfected his long-range communication system. As you know, gentlemen, at each end of such a system, there's a power unit, a transmitter and a receiver. Here is our receiver, Tobor himself. When he is switched from direct to infinite control, he is capable of receiving thought impulses over any conceivable span. It is only the transmitter which Dr. Harrison and I are in process of perfecting. How about giving us a look at his innards, Professor? Uh, or are they top secret, too? I don't mind if Tobor doesn't. <laughs>
now, gentlemen, I think I've said everything I can say of importance tonight. I gotta see Toe Ward. I just gotta. I'm not questioning your integrity as a journalist, Mr. Gilligan. I'm simply requesting again that you confine your coverage to the facts contained in Professor Nordstrom's handout. Now look, Doc, we don't tell you how to run your job. I realize that, Mr. Gilligan, but your papers aren't exactly famous for their conservative handling of the news. Now, just a minute. That's the trouble with you scientists. You won't face up to the facts of life. Ralph, I have to put my car away. Would you give me a hand with the garage door? I'd like to, very much. you could make it, gentlemen. Goodbye.
okay? They're all out. Very good. I'll bet he's doing it. what he did. He actually worked out all those controls and got Tober back in his box all within five minutes. Oh, Dad, you're wonderful. <laughs> but he was bad, very bad. You go to bed, Janice. Ralph and Carl and I'll get this rubbish all squared away. Good night. Good night, darling. <laughs> Still beats me how that kid worked out those controls. I'd hate to try it with a slide rule. I told you that boy's a genius. Hey, wait a minute. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. How many news services do you ask to send representatives tonight, Professor? Twelve, as you know. Why? Because there are 13 empty chairs, and tonight every one of them is filled. <laughs> In 1953, Black Ford sedan. License number 9Y-33-26. That's the last number on the list, Sheriff. Professor Nordstrom's man was instructed to admit all newsmen showing a proper letter of accreditation. Unfortunately, the professor admitted to tell him just how many were expected, so that 13th letter must have been a forgery. Incidentally, Sheriff, I'd appreciate it if you'd pass those license numbers on to the FBI. No, no, we won't be needing your deputies to guard us. We're taking our own precautions, and Professor Nordstrom assures me that they're more than adequate. Thanks again, Sheriff. Goodbye. 22 university degrees, and I forget to tell Carl the number of letters. No wonder they tell jokes about absent-minded professors. Well, that's spilled milk now. At least we're alerted that somebody is mighty curious about Tobor. Let's hope that those precautions of yours are rugged enough to keep him out. Well, that at least I can guarantee. Come on, Carl. Let's check the wiring. Gimmicks. Always gimmicks. I wish someone would tell me exactly who or what we're guarding against. Well, we built the basic emotional patterns for a constructive mission into Tobor. Now just think what would happen if someone else, some potential enemy, built destructive patterns into a few thousand like him. Oh. What a terrifying thought. Thank you. 
anything new. They still haven't posted a guard. Hmm. I should. It's been four days now, and I haven't seen a soul. You must have got away with it. Might be a trap. Well, how do we play it, then? Wait for a break? Unfortunately, my friend, we haven't much time. The highest party officials are concerned. They feel that once Nordstrom has perfected his control system, the federal government will take over. It will be considerably more difficult for us to get at it. And so? So we get into the house. That's better. See, I, I rigged the telepathic pickup so that it fits behind the ear where it's close to the sensory brain centers. It conveys every impulse to the control device here where you can increase or diminish the vibrations. The whole thing fits as comfortably as a hearing aid. Excellent, Ralph. Excellent. <clears throat> now, here's the uh, transmitter receiver. I moved the tuning band to this end. Beautiful. Now, it's all set. You want to start? I think you ought to operate these tests, Ralph. This whole new system is your work. No, no, you go ahead. All right. I uh, worked out a series of reaction tests. Uh, should they are. That's all I could think of for him to say. Who the devil's that? Gadge, what are you doing down here? I heard you working too, boy. Can I come and watch? You seem to be here already. All right. <laughs> the screen. Let's see how he adapts himself to the sonal compass. So far, so good. I wonder how he'd take to the white hot meteorites.
Just a bad bump. Oh. Come on, son. Easy, Gadge. There you are. You darn old Tobor! You better watch out! Easy, Gadge. Tobor can't hurt us now. I wonder exactly what happened. I think Tobor suffered what in a human being would be a nervous breakdown. Those meteors came at him so fast that he couldn't take it. I think you're right. I think all we have to do is to insulate against overloading the receptors. If we do that, maybe we've jumped the last hurdle. What are you doing now? I'm switching them on again. Those receptors must have cooled off by now. Let's see if he's still functioning. You're all right now, Tobor. Watch where you're going. There's another one of Tobor's synthetic instincts, concern for the young, race preservation. Or to put it less academically, human love. Okay, Tobor. I guess you didn't know what you're doing. Two fifty even, lady. Thanks. Okay, just another customer. Will you be through shortly? Not a half hour ought to do it. Good. Soon I'll have to leave to fetch Dr. Gustav. When do we make our move? Not before midnight, perhaps later. Depends on the house being dark. Ready, Doctor. I am a man of science, not of action. I... This is your duty. All you have to do is to inspect and photograph this work of Nordstrom's. Leave everything else to us. Paul, you go first. Max, you follow us. Camera number six, Carl. That ought to show him up. Intruders approximately 100 yards north of house. Intruders approximately 100 yards north of house. Intruders it's amazing how this television camera of yours can photograph at night without lights. Not television, infravision. Hit camera number eight, Carl. Intruders now approaching house. 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 Now, Herr Professor? Now. Shoot it. 
No one is. That's a recorded soundtrack from a movie studio right out of the sands of Iwo Jima. Let's go. Smart cookie, that Nordstrom. Too smart for us, maybe. It mustn't be. I needn't remind you our employers will not tolerate any more failures on your part, nor mine. Hmm. Well, what do we do now? We think, my friend. Or rather, I think. And this is what I think. Since we cannot get in to see Nordstrom's secrets for ourselves, we must induce him to come out and tell them to us. A tall order, I would say. Not necessarily. There must be a vulnerable spot. Of course. Nordstrom worships his grandson. The grandson worships... Intersections, Gadge. Gee, I'm sorry, Mom, but look, look it. Oh, wonderful. What day is it? It's Tuesday. And who's going to be your friend? Well, I'd like to invite you, Mom, but I doubt if you understand this sort of thing. Oh, no, I suppose not. Well, guess Graham's my only man. I'll go see him right away. Good. Now Tobar can turn his own switch on or off when he's called. Better he should learn to clean the house and drive the car. So I can spend all my time making toys for you to play with. It's all finished. A new transmitter rod built inside a pencil. You made it beautifully, Carl. But for what? That you can play schoolboy tricks on very important people when you show Tobo off tonight. <laughs> Gimmicks. Sorry to disturb you, Professor, but I thought you'd want me to remind you about your date with Gash for the planetarium. What's the matter with me these days? Your very important persons will be here at 7 o'clock sharp, remember? Oh, we'll be back an hour before that. You mark my words. Ah, here you are, partner. Come on, let's hit the trail.
funny. Where, where's everyone else? Probably inside. Come on, Gramps. Something must have happened. I know Dad's careless about time, but he wouldn't be an hour late, not tonight. I still think he had a flat tire or he ran out of gas. No, you don't. That's what you hope happened. Oh, Ralph, I'm worried. All right, I'll phone the sheriff's office. That's the brass. Okay. I'll phone from down the lab. You meet him and just tell him he'll be a little late. Come on, now, it's not I'll be all right. Good evening, General. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening. How are you? How do you do? How do you Good do? evening. Gramps, Gramps, you all right? Yes, I'm fine. How about you? I'm okay. Have you quite recovered, Professor Nordstrom? I'm fully conscious, if that's what you mean and therefore able to understand your position. Completely, I assure you. Perhaps not as completely as you think. Of course, as a man of intelligence, you have realized that you are obviously here to talk. But you may not have anticipated what happens if you don't. I'm sorry, but you'll have to raise your voice a little. I said you may not have anticipated what happens if you don't. Something very unpleasant, I should say. Judging by the look of you and your friends? Yes, very unpleasant. But to whom? That's my point. Don't you tell him, Gramps. Please don't you tell him. Just yes, shut your mouth. Don't look for trouble, Gage. You seem to have me over a barrel. I take it you want the formulae for my extrasensory transmission method. Very well. <clears throat> Do I tell them to you, or write them down, or what? You will not have the opportunity to give us double talk, Professor. You will have to relay your discoveries to a colleague almost as distinguished as yourself. How do you do, sir? I'm sorry I can't get up to greet you. How do you do, Professor? Oh, uh, please forgive me. My doctor told me only this week that I was getting a little deaf. Uh, my pocket, if you please. Put that over my head, behind my ear, please. Ah, that's much better. And so, gentlemen, I'm afraid the question of whether Tobor is capable of uh, guiding a multi-stage rocket across interstellar space is highly debatable let alone as being able to deal with all the emergency situations of such a journey. I don't know, Mr. Commissioner. After all, we've had automatic pilots on both conventional aircraft and guided missiles since the middle of World War II. Uh, what do you think, Congressman? Well, all I can say, sir, is the motto of one of the greatest states in our union is, show me. And that's exactly what Professor Nostrum will have to do. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. Automatic pilots are one thing, intelligent direction, of a billion dollar space cruiser is something else. Yes? Yes, I see. Thank you, Sheriff. Let me know if you hear anything. A moment, please, gentlemen. It's no good trying to keep it from you any longer about Professor Nordstrom's failure to be here. Frankly, we don't know where he is. 
He and his grandson left early today, presumably to visit a science show at the planetarium in Los Angeles. They were to be back at 5.30. That was the sheriff's office on the phone. They have no news of Professor Nostrum or the boy. Neither has the Los Angeles Police Department nor the FBI. And there was no science show scheduled at the planetarium today. Well, isn't there something we can do instead of just uh, standing around? Yeah. Afraid not, except wait. Oh, it shouldn't be. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, these principles, you must understand, had to be reduced to a working form. If I could jot down the basic equations, it would save us a lot of time. Is that correct, Doctor? Well, most certainly. Very well. Paul, release his hands. I strongly advise you, Doctor, to confine yourself to the matter in hand. Pencil and paper. Gramps, don't you do it! Please don't you kill him! I still can't. Don't try to get up. If you please. Certainly. As soon as I can write. <clears throat> Pencil. I have another one right here. I think so. This figure, it cannot be correct. Oh, I'm sorry. Just a slip. This is the third slip you've made, Nostrum. I'm very sorry. I'm trying to remember an extremely complicated formula. I should have my notes. Of course, I could stimulate your memory with artificial methods.
Open up his shirt. It is good, Professor, but it is only a promise. Now we come to the big step, yes? Yes. In a minute, but first, hadn't we better go over the data again to make sure? Professor, you seem to forget that I was present when you said that you hadn't yet perfected the long-distance transmitter for Tobor. Could it be that you have solved that problem so soon? You better use mine and use it quick. I won't stand for this any longer. You'll give the required information immediately. Max! Wait, wait! No, Graham, stop! All right! You win. Transmitting power's been cut off. Isn't there anything you can do? I don't know. Maybe one chance. If Gadge and the professor are near this spot, they may be able to reach him on a direct telepathic impulse. Tobor, please come get us. Please come and get us, Tobor. Why now? Up and go. Now he is cooperating. What's that?
Over there. I'm afraid I was, but I withdraw my observation. Gee, Tobor, you're wonderful. Ice cold Coca Cola with a bright, ripe taste and a special sparkle all its own. Enjoy your Coke at our snack stand right now. The show starts in nine minutes.
The show starts in eight minutes. Fresh candies, the flavors you love. Assorted drinks, your favorite beverages. Hot coffee. Hot dogs, the way you like them. Ice cream, smoothly delicious. The show will start in seven minutes. Here's a choice of food and drink to satisfy anyone and everyone. You'll find something to please you to add to your evening's enjoyment. Something to please all tastes and age groups. The show starts in six minutes. in five minutes. The show starts in four minutes. starts in three minutes.
show starts in two minutes. Show starts in one minute. with the show. This is 254 on the Ludlow swing, reporting a 984-2. We'll be checking in in 45 minutes. 10-4, car 254, KLP 646. Pull over. I saw something. to Champaign Urbana. Urbana to 254, go ahead. Car 254 to Urbana. 
We're investigating an accident at Junction 45 in Ludlow Cutoff. Foul play suspected. Send homicide detail. Oh, yeah. The driver may have been William Summerfield, 177 Decatur Street, Ludlow, Illinois. One of you stay on the scene. The other investigate the Ludlow address. 10-4. Car 254, KLP 646. You heard the man. Yep. Looks like a girl's sweater. Blood. We're battered to car 88. Come in, car 88. Car 88 to Urbana. McKenzie here. Go ahead. Car 254 has failed to report. Is that car in your area? No, not here. 10 4, car 88. This is KLP 646, Urbana, calling car 254. Come in, car 254. Urbana to car 254. Come in, car 254. Urbana to car 254. Come in, car 254. Hello, I'm at Ludlow. The whole town's destroyed. Everybody's gone. You gotta do something. You won't believe this. Send help, lots of help, quick. Lady, just follow the arrows. Any chance of getting through? Nope. What happened? Look, lady, just detour, will you please? Tell him to take that detail out of there. The old man is sending a replacement. Right. I'm sorry, soldier. I should have explained. I'm Audrey Ames, National Wire Service. Yes, ma'am. How do I get there? I'm sorry, my orders are to let no one through. Well, that surely doesn't include the press. I'm sorry, ma'am. No one is what the old man said. But was it very bad? Many get hurt? Look, lady, you're not going to fish any information out of me. Now, why don't you get back on the main road? It's about a mile south. Allowed. Look, you have no right to do that. Sorry, ma'am. I'd like to see your commanding officer, please. Where could I find him? You'll find him in Paxton. He headquarters there. I'll leave your camera at the roadblock.
continue to be routed around the Ludlow area according to special orders Good morning. Able 6. Good morning. I'd like to see your commanding officer, please. Oh, I'm sorry, but the colonel's busy. Perhaps Captain Barton can help you. Sentry. Ma'am? This will cover the whole situation you asked for, sir. Thanks, Lieutenant. Sit down, please. Are you the Audrey Ames who covered Korea for that picture magazine? That's right. I read the book you wrote after the war. Liked it very much. Well, thank you. You're with National Wire Service now. I was on my way to Chanute Field to do a picture story on a new jet plane they're unveiling, and I ran into a roadblock. So? Well, Captain, there was a town beyond that roadblock. A town that isn't there anymore. Until we find out exactly what happened, we'd like to avoid publicity. You have any idea what happened? I'm sorry, Miss Lee. Captain, you can't suppress a story like this. We're not trying to, Miss Ames. But until we have more facts... Look, will you give us your word you won't release a story until we give the go-ahead? You have my word. Sometime during the night, the town of Ludlow was completely demolished. The town's population, about 150 people, vanished. Vanished? No bodies, nothing. Well, there must be some trace. I know it's hard to believe, Miss Ames, but a special detail combed through the wreckage for two solid hours and couldn't find a thing. Was it an explosion? We don't know. 150 people just don't vanish into thin air. We're still trying to find out what happened. If you'd like to sit in... Yes, thank you, I would. Dave, what time did you leave Ludlow last night? Must have been after 11 o'clock. My son-in-law watched the television news at 10.30, so I sat there and watched that. And my daughter wanted me to sit there and talk a while. Then I got to thinking that I had to get up early. So I took off. Did you notice anything strange or unusual about the house or about the way the family acted? No, same as always. When you're driving out of town, nothing out of the way in the street, the building or the sky? No unusual light, some sound or movement? Well, I heard something sound like thunder. And about midnight, a plane went over. All right, Dave. I can call on you again if I need you? Oh, yes, sure. Edna? Is that the telephone company's official transcripts? I put through the last call to Ludlow at 11.59 p.m. Mm -hmm. When did you first notice anything wrong with the Ludlow connection? 4.45 this morning. I phoned the company linesman to go out there right away. So the telephone lines could have gone down anywhere between 11.59 and 4.45. All right, Edna, thanks. You've been very helpful. Oh, uh, Colonel Sturgeon. Miss Ames, the National Wire Service. How do you do? Uh, Audrey Ames, I've read a lot of your stuff, seen a lot of your photographs. Yes? Set to go, sir, whenever you're ready. I'll be right there. I hope you understand our problem, our need to keep this quiet. Yes, Captain's briefed me. If anyone wants me, I can be reached in Ludlow by radio. Yes, sir. How's chances of me going along? Not this trip, maybe later. In any case, not until we know what's out there. Oh, by the way, Colonel, my camera was taken from me at the roadblock by one of your men. I'll give orders to have it released. Oh, there has to be a logical explanation for this. The town of 150 people just doesn't disappear. This one did. Operator. I'd like to place a person-to-person -person call, please, to Mr. Norman Taggart, Editor-in-Chief of National Wire Service. The number is Murray Hill 44836. In what city, please? New York. Odd. You wind up that jet plane story already? I'm not on the jet story, Norm. Listen, I'm on to something I think can be real big. Mm-hmm. 
Where? Oh. Brother. Huh? What do you mean we can't print it? I've given my word to hold off for a while. Now listen, Norm. A plane flew over Ludlow last night about midnight. Just about the time the lid blew off. Check on it. And uh, check Washington. See if they had an atomic installation in the Ludlow area. Okay. Call me back as soon as you have anything, right? Goodbye. Sorry, miss. You can't. Oh, it's you again. I know I can't. But I'd like to have my camera back, please. Colonel Sturgeon said he was going to speak to somebody. Hey, Corporal. Matthias. She wants her camera back. Hello, Norm. What's the score? Wrong track, baby. The airlines confirm a commercial liner over Ludlow at 12.03 last night. There are no atomic installations, secret or otherwise, within 75 miles of Ludlow. Well, it was a possibility. The only people who've been playing around with uh, radioactive materials in your vicinity is the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Department of Agriculture? Yeah, they've got an experimental project just outside Paxton. U.S. Department of Agriculture, Illinois Experimental Station. Okay, I've got that. I'll, I'll keep in touch. I beg your pardon. <clears throat> I beg your pardon. Oh! Hello. Oh, hello. I... I spoke to him, but I guess he didn't hear me. Oh. He's a deaf mute. Working with radiation can be dangerous. Accident last year cost him his speech and his hearing. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking for the project director. Oh, I'm the project director. My name's Ed Wainwright. What can I do for you? Oh, excuse me a minute. I'm sorry, Frank. <laughs> Nothing to worry about, just a slight catastrophe. Do you have these catastrophes very often? <laughs> All the time. Sorry to keep these little things from getting in. These are snails. Last summer it was caterpillars. And after that it was grasshoppers by the drove. And just last week it was beetles. Now, what can I do for you? Well, Mr. Wainwright, I'm Audrey Ames. I'm with National Wire Service. I suppose you've heard about what happened in Ludlow. Yes. I'm trying to find out what was responsible, and it occurred to me that radiation of some sort might have caused the destruction out there. No, I don't think so. Here. We're the only people around here using radioactive materials. And isotopes aren't explosive. So I'm afraid your answer isn't here. Oh, I see. Now tell me, is this thing really a strawberry? Yes. And these are tomatoes. This, we hope, is the future of the American farmer. And for that matter, all farmers everywhere. Can you eat them? No, not yet. But we hope to develop one day a hybrid that can be eaten. How is it there hasn't been any publicity on this? Oh, there have been a few stories in farm journals, but to most of the public, these giants are just freaks of nature. No practical value. Well, how do they get so big? Well, radiation causes photosynthesis, that is, the, the growing process to continue night and day. 
Radioisotopes act as a sort of artificial sun, sun that never sets. It's fascinating. Uh, tell me, what's he doing? Well, that's plant food, essential minerals. Keeps the plants from burning themselves out. They have to be fed constantly. Actually, the fruit would grow much larger if we didn't limit the stimulation. Maybe you'd like to do a story on us. I'd be glad to tell you more about the work. Thank you very much. I'd be very interested, but... Well, right now I'm working on this Ludlow story. Uh, thanks again. Right. Goodbye. Bye. You here? Well, he wouldn't let me inside, so... Oh, Colonel, Springfield is on the line. Colonel, you just got back from Ludlow. You said after you got back, I could go. I said maybe. Well, how about it? Tomorrow it'll be open for the press. Oh, Colonel, be fair. I played ball with you. Give me the jump on the other reporters who'll be in here. At least let me take some pictures in Ludlow. I promise I won't put them on the wire till tomorrow. Well, I guess you rate that. For effort, anyway. Barton, take my to Ludlow. And I hope you have a strong stomach. We're going to take some pictures in Ludlow. If uh, we're not back in 15 minutes, better come in after us. Yes, sir. Let him through. People use calendars to tell age. I could use ruins to count mine. I was 25 when I went through Seoul after it was shelled. I was 20 when I took my camera into Cologne and Berlin after World War II. Must be used to it by now. Captain, there's some things you never get used to. How about a drink to wipe away some memories? Good way to get rid of the jitters. I know a little place. How do 150 people vanish into thin air? Well, around this part of the country, things seem to have a way of vanishing. Only a couple of months ago, it was a warehouse. Kind of fell apart overnight, just like Ludlow. Decide to come back and do a story on us? Well, no. As a matter of fact, I came back for some help. I'd like you to do me a favor. Anything I can. Remember the warehouse that was destroyed about three months ago? Uh-huh. I want you to take me to see it. Oh, well, I, uh, I'd like to, but I've got too much work in my hands right now. How about tomorrow? Three months ago, a warehouse was destroyed, and the one person in it vanished. This morning, Ludlow was destroyed. All the people in it vanished. Don't you see a possible tie-up? It's possible, I suppose. What do you want me to do? Just ride out there with me and take a look at it. <laughs> I don't understand what good that'll do. The authorities investigated it thoroughly. Well, the sheriff thinks in terms of crime and publicity. You're a scientist. You think in terms of cause and effect. Maybe you'll see something that the sheriff missed. <laughs> well, that shouldn't be too difficult. Still, I, I don't know. What's he saying? <laughs> he says that, uh, that your lips are easy to read, that your theory makes you a very bright girl in his book, and that he'd like to go along with us. Good. <laughs> well, you barge into people's lives and drag them off to places they don't really want to go, aren't you sort of in danger of becoming unpopular? Well, it's an occupational hazard. How'd you pick such an occupation? 
I think it sort of pecked me. I guess I was just born inquisitive. Ever since I can remember, I wanted to know the why and wherefore of just about everything I saw. I inherited my knack with the camera from Dad. My curiosity supplied the nose for news, and the camera supplied the memory. <laughs> so there you have it. What about you? Have you always been interested in science? Oh, I guess I always have been in one way or another. I used to fool around with radios and anything electrical when I was a kid. I was a radar officer during the war, and then I went into this when I got out. Ah, uh, yes, I remember now that every time I read one of your articles, it was dateline from some area of flood or famine or war. Made me realize what a sheltered life we scientists really lead. Sheltered? Look what happened to Frank. as though some force had to push these walls out from the inside. Think it was an explosion? No, it couldn't have been. Any explosion big enough to destroy this warehouse would certainly have been heard in Ludlow. What was it they kept stored here? Wheat. Almost a million bushels. It's a lot of wheat. And there was surplus to keep the market from being oversupplied. Doesn't it strike you as a little strange that out of all that wheat there's not a grain left anywhere? No, that's nature's way, Audrey. Birds probably cleaned up the leavings. See what you mean, Frank. What is it, Ed? You see how barren this ground is? Well, I don't know. I've seen horses leave it like this. Well, this is deeper than horses go and much more thorough. Practically down to the roots. Now, horses pick and choose. They leave patches. Mm. But this is completely barren. Leave it to old Frank. He'll make a botanist out of me yet. You're head of a government lab and you need lessons in botany? Well, I try to teach him what I can about my field of study. He tries to teach me what he can about his. Aren't you a botanist? No, no, I'm an entomologist. The study of insects. Well, then how come you're working with plants? Well, the, uh, the existence and development of plants and insects are very closely related. They're highly dependent on one another. As a plain matter of fact, one couldn't live without the other. And that's why I can't understand. Ground like this is usually teeming with insects. This area is completely devoid of it. I think I'd like to get some shots of this. I'm going back to the car for my camera. All right. Here, let me help you. What was that? I don't know. The 
The Geiger counter has shown no radioactivity to speak of, sir. Only background. There's got to be an explanation somewhere. I've got your explanation for you, Tom. Ed. Now, listen. You've known me ever since I came to Paxton. You know I'm not given to hysteria, and you've got to listen to me with an open mind. Take it easy, Ed. Locusts. What are you talking about? I'm talking about giant locusts. Giant locusts are responsible for all of this. Are you nuts? No evidence of any explosion, Colonel. Buildings look more like they were hit with a battering ram. We found these guns at the scene. The kind people keep in their homes. And they've been fired. Okay. Lieutenant. Now listen, Tom. These are eight feet tall, some even bigger. They're vicious, merciless killers. Now, Ed. Lieutenant. Lieutenant, phone Springfield again. Tell him I'm still waiting for those specialists. Yes, sir. Frank Johnson is dead. He was killed not half an hour ago. It was horrible. Obviously, you're both under a strain, Won't but... you listen? You've got to get some soldiers out there before more people are killed. Miss Ames, the governor asked me to exercise discretion in dealing with you. Please don't make it any harder for me than it is. You have to believe us. Listen, you've seen the giant plants out at the lab. Are you trying to tell me you bred these things? In a sense, I did, yes. Some locusts must have gotten into the lab, and they ate some of the plants or some of the radioactive plant food. Well, their cell division accelerated immediately. That is, they started to grow abnormally fast. Well, they had to have a constant food supply to sustain this growth. So, a couple of months ago, they wandered into the grain elevator outside of town. When they grew to this giant size, they pushed their way out. Well, they just pushed the building down. Yes. Each one of them has the strength of ten men. There are probably two or three hundred of them. So last night, not satisfied with eating the grain, they came to Ludlow. Yes. <laughs> Even if I went for your story about the size, it would be hard to believe they'd attack people. Sergeant, that report come in from the chemists? No, not yet, sir. Why won't you listen? I am listening. We saw Frank Johnson killed by a giant locust. Sure, and there are reliable people who've also seen flying saucers and weird little men from Mars. Well, take another look at that town out there. Or have you found the answer? Lieutenant? Yes, sir. I'm taking a detail out for a look around. You're to keep radio contact. I want ten men. Get them on the truck. Yes, sir. All right, Ed. You can show me the exact spot where you saw... Well, whatever it was you saw. Oh, no. Well, after all, it's his grasshopper. some crazy grasshoppers. Why would they give us nets instead of rifles? All right, tell them to spread out. All right, man, pan out. Here's the spot, Tom. Where's the body? There isn't any body. Just like Ludlow. All right, man, into the woods. train one of these giant what's it's to pull a plow, huh? Chuck? Huh? I don't like this place. Ah, right, take it easy. You know, grasshoppers are good eating. Yeah? Much to the ketchup. No, nah, no kidding. I ate them once down in Mexico. Well, you better watch your step. They'll have a good even. They must have seen something. Mr. Wainwright's a scientist. He's trained to see things right. Well, these days they blame the atom for everything. Bad health, bad crops, bad weather. Now it's grasshoppers. They couldn't have just dreamed up this guy Frank being knocked off. Ah.
available man. Also get some air support. We'll bomb him out of that forest. What are you going to do? Going in there and wipe out every last one. They'll slaughter you. Not this time. I want light artillery brought up with Company H. You don't have enough men. There'll be three regiments out there tomorrow by 0300. You don't understand. You still don't have enough men. Not enough men for a couple of hundred locusts? There are more than a couple of hundred. But you said before... That was that... before I heard them screech. The noise they made convinces me there are more. How many are there? I don't know. There could be countless numbers. I think you better call in the regular army, Tom. Where would I get off calling for the regular army to handle some oversized grasshoppers? Why, they'd section eight me right out of the service. Lieutenant, yes. take charge of the East Sector. Yes, You're making sir. a mistake, Tom. I'm afraid he doesn't understand how serious this is. Well, after all, he knows what the military is capable of. Well, that's just it. He has faith in regimental firepower because he's seen it work. But he's never come up against an enemy like this before. Then you've done all you can. No, no, I haven't. In a way, I feel responsible, Audrey. Humphrey's in deadly danger if those locusts break out of the forest. What are you going to do? I'm going to Washington. Maybe the Army people will listen to me. I'll go with you. Maybe I can help. I saw them, too. All right. We've got to convince them, Audrey. We may be witnessing the beginning of an era that will mean the complete annihilation of man. Annihilation? Annihilation. The beginning of the end. This gentleman is the enemy. This locust, more commonly known as the grasshopper, is almost identical to the giant locust of Ludlow, except for its size and the fact that the giant's wings fail to develop. They cannot fly. The locust is intelligent. It's strong. Locusts follow a leader. Like the bee and the ant, they're able to communicate with each other. This communication or call is produced by the hind legs. This is the 1956 Australian locust plague. Covered an area of 400 square miles. We've been plagued by locusts since biblical times. We've tried various forms of combating them. As a matter of fact, in our own country, the early settlers of the Massachusetts Bay Colony armed themselves with bundles of brush and drove millions of locusts into the sea. Now today, despite the fact that we've developed powerful insecticides, the locust still inflicts damages to the tune of $25 million in the United States alone. California, Colorado, Texas, even this small locust will attack a man. It has two powerful jaws that are edged with sharp teeth. It will kill other insects and devour them. If no other insects are available, it becomes a cannibal, turning on its own kind. Now, you've seen what the locust can do in its normal size, smaller than your thumb. Imagine, if you will, a locust that's grown bigger than a man and is continuing to grow, some larger than others, but each one a deadly killer. I hope you realize we haven't much time. You are a scientist, Mr. Wainwright. You know what locusts can do. I'm a soldier. I know what guns can do. I feel secure the Illinois National Guard can handle this situation. Did you want to say something, General Hanson? No, sir. I was greatly impressed with your presentation, Wainwright. I'm sure all of us were. Thank you very much for coming. I'm afraid my presentation didn't impress you quite enough, General. I don't understand you. I mean that when the locusts start to move out of that forest, I'm not sure you'll be able to stop them. What are you suggesting we do, Mr. Wainwright? Hit them with everything you've got now. You need more men, a lot more men. You need tanks and heavy artillery. As of now, the full strength of the Illinois National Guard is in the lines surrounding the Ludlow, Illinois forest. As I said before, Mr. Wainwright, you are a scientist. Why not leave the fighting to the military? Urgent call from Paxton, Illinois, sir. <clears throat> General Short here. Yes. Yes, I see. Thank you. Matt will fly to Paxton with Mr. Wainwright. We'll take charge of operations. Mr. Wainwright, I owe you an apology. The locusts have broken through our defense lines. Thousands of casualties. 
Our troops are reorganizing to prevent Faxon itself from being overrun. The hill position in the suburbs of Paxton must be held. Otherwise, the 100 miles between Paxton and Chicago will lie open. General, we can't land in Paxton, sir. Why not? It just came over the radio, sir. Giant locusts have overrun Paxton at 1400. Head for Chicago. Yes, sir. Captain, I want these positions held. I want them held at all costs, if humanly possible. And Captain, have your map people immediately turn out 300 overlays, showing the Chicago defense line is tentatively set. Yes? Major Everett. What about Squadron 12? They haven't reported in yet, General. Well, let me know the moment you're here. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'll be with you in a moment. Bill, you'll proceed at once to temporary GHQ Central Sector and assume command. Norm, you will order the 81st Armored Division to proceed without delay from Fort Sheridan to Chicago. Have the CG report to me upon arrival. Request the Defense Department to alert the following divisions, the 1st Armored, the 40th, the 1st Airborne, the 92nd, and the 76th. Now, what's your problem? Food. At the rate refugees are pouring into Chicago, General, our emergency stocks won't last long. Toxaphene is one we haven't tried. How good is it? Almost as powerful as chlordane. All right, ship 2,000 gallons out to the base. Excuse me. Hello. They're speaking. Squadron 12 just reported. They say they came down on the deck and practically drowned the enemy in insecticide. The chlordane didn't even slow them down. You'll have to come up with something stronger. I'll do my best, General. Goodbye. Stuff's no good. Forget it. Pretty bad, doesn't it? I thought you went back to New York. Well, the big story's here. Well, look, your editor called you back because it was too dangerous. I wanted to be here. Nothing we've done so far. Insecticides, fire, bombs. Nothing has done any good. In so little time. Well, you're doing everything you can. Well, everybody is, but it's not good enough. The time will come when the beasts will inherit the earth. No, there's no sign of the locusts yet, General. Out. And with an arc of five divisions to the west and south of Chicago, General Hansen is confident that he can keep the menace at bay. Units of the Air Forces and Marines are moving into position to back up those forces already deployed by the Army. Now, the one advantage our forces hold over the enemy is that they always reveal their intention to attack. Before every attack, the locusts send forth this warning in the form of a high-pitched screech. Now, this screech increases in intensity until it reaches ear-shattering proportions. And it's when this screech reaches its full intensity that the locusts attack. We've got every available man in the line, Major, and I think there's no question but what we'll be.
this program for an important announcement. The giant locusts have reached the Chicago South Side and nearby suburbs. I repeat, the giant locusts have reached the Chicago South Side and nearby suburbs. Keep calm. Take shelter in basements. Take shelter in basements. Do not panic. Attention, please. Attention, please. Keep moving. Do not block the highway. Push stalled cars off road at once. Keep all traffic moving. Do not panic. Do not panic. <laughs> Sames, draw up a chair and sit down. I sent for you because of a new development that may be favorable to us. The locusts have stopped their advance. They are huddled in the alleys and buildings just outside the loop. The locusts got cold. When the temperature drops below 68 degrees, they just stop moving. Well, maybe now is the time we could move in and destroy them. Well, they aren't in hibernation, sir. They'll move if they're provoked, and they're just as deadly as ever. When the sun comes out tomorrow, they'll be active again. The Air Force is standing by with a B-52 loaded with an atom bomb. You can't drop an atom bomb on Chicago. Washington has given me authority to do just that, as a last contingency. If the bomb is dropped early tomorrow, there'll be no loss of life. The city will be evacuated by then. But what about the property? There'll be a billion dollars worth of damage in a site that's too contaminated to rebuild on. I realize that. But if we don't drop the bomb, Chicago will almost certainly fall. The bomber crew is alerted for a drop at dawn. If we don't come up with something by then, I'll make a final check with Washington and relay their OK. Isn't there a chance the locusts could die in the night of the cold? No, not at this time of year. It takes 24 hours of exposure at 14 degrees. Isn't there some way you could? Drive them into the lake? In Washington, you said the settlers did that. Settlers? Hmm? Oh, oh, the early settlers in Massachusetts did literally drive them into the sea. But they weren't dealing with giants. Wait a minute. We can't drive them. Not drive. But we could attract them. Attract. If we could reproduce their call, General, it might work. It just might work. A call for insects? Have you ever been duck hunting, General? The duck call? Yes. There's one for bees, too. They use it in apiaries. It might work. What do you need? Well, let me see. I need, uh, I need an audio oscillator. I need an audio two. Two audio amplifiers, the most powerful you can get. I need an oscilloscope. I need some high-frequency radio equipment. And a boat, a fast boat. Whatever you need, we'll get. Well, there's one thing I have to get myself. Something that'll tell me when I've succeeded. Well, what's that? A live giant grasshopper. be around here somewhere. All right, man, off the truck. Major. 
I'd suggest that you send some of them that way and some down there, and you and I try the alley. Okay. Uh, you four men go that way, you men that way. Let's go. We got one of the smaller grasshoppers. They're not too close, Major. We put that cage up in a hurry, and I don't know how strong it is. A month ago, I was teaching my engineering class at the university. It was safe and secure. And look at me now. You know, I'm 37 years old, and all of a sudden I realized for the first time how much I've taken life for granted. I guess that's something you can't take for granted, Major. Ed, how will you know when you've got the right sound? He'll tell us. How? Oh. He'll react to it. And this polygraph will record his reaction. Well, how long will it take? It's a matter of trial and error. It could take 10 minutes or 10 hours. We don't have 10 hours. We're dropping that bomb at dawn. Uh, how does this work? Well, I've just attached these wires from the polygraph to the two copper strips at the base of the cage. Now, the locust, like every other living thing, has galvanic reflexes or electrical charges in direct ratio to its activity or emotional stimulation. I don't understand. Well, in other words, when we hit the correct sound or signal, the grasshopper will react to it and the polygraph will record the change. Now, you notice how steady and regular the movement of the needle is now? Well, when we reproduce the grasshopper's call, the lines will become longer and highly irregular. It's like a lie detector test, isn't it? Uh-huh. But it's the first time a grasshopper ever got one. Now, if you'll keep your eye on the needle for any unusual jumps or dips, we'll get to work. You've had your chance. Now it's the Air Force's turn. Operator. 
Operator, this is a top priority call. Get me General Wagner at the air base. Look, General, the locusts outside will stay put until the temperature reaches 68 degrees. That's about an hour and a half from now. Wagner, Chicago has been evacuated. Unless you receive instructions to the contrary by 0616, that is, that is 90 minutes from now, you will order your B-52 crew to deliver the bomb on the designated target. Repeat the instructions back to me. Correct. There's no time to fool with that now. Major, get a detail of men up here to move this stuff. And bring some extra grenades. There's some of my staff car. There's a new lab set up for you at my new HQ outside the city. I can't move now. Well, you can't stay here, not with an atom bomb hanging over your head. I don't have any choice. Look, up to now, we've been using a filtered signal, and it hasn't worked. But it's just possible that the hearing apparatus of the locust can detect harmonic frequencies above the human range. Well, to test these frequencies, I need every minute that's left. If you'll just give me one man to replace Miss Ames. I'm staying. Well, look, this is no time to be worrying about a big story. I'm not worried about a story. Will you please leave before it's too late? No. Major, you and a detail of two men will remain here with Mr. Wainwright. I will station men at three observation posts. One in the suburbs, one near the Art Institute, and one on top of a downtown hotel. Also, a helicopter will spot from above. There will be a getaway car parked downstairs at the main entrance. I suggest you use it by... by 5.45 at the very latest. If you are successful, Contact me at once, so I can stop the bomb. Chicago GHQ. Emergency lab of Chicago GHQ. Come in, General. Are you there? 
Now listen to me, Wainwright. We found it, General. We found the frequency. Good. Now stand by. I've got to stop that A-bomb. I'll get right back to you. Chicago GHQ to double B. Chicago GHQ to double B. Chicago GHQ to double B. Over. This is double B. Come in, Chicago GHQ. Over. Hanson here. Your mission is canceled. Return to your base. Repeat the message. Over. Mission canceled. Return to base. Over. Chicago GHQ to emergency lab. Right here. The show is yours, Wainwright. All right. Get that equipment on the lake in a boat, and I'll be your Pied Piper. I still don't understand. Why didn't you put the oscillator in the boat in the first place to send out the call? Why track them here? Because we'd never get them all. Here, look. Now, here we are in downtown Chicago, near the lake. Now, the locusts are scattered all through the suburbs and on the south side. Now, we'll send out the call from here. Yes, but that's going to attract them to us, not into the water. Well, first of all, it's imperative that every last one of the locusts hear the call. Now, in order to do that, we've got to get our amplifier speaker at the highest possible point to get maximum range. Now, we've got ours on the roof of this building, which is one of the tallest in Chicago. Now, once we get them here... Oh, I see. Then the boat will take over. Exactly. Once we have them in the heart of the loop near our location, they'll be within range of the amplifier on the boat. Now, we'll then radio our oscillator signal out to the boat, and they, in turn, will rebroadcast it over their amplifier, attracting the locusts to them and into the lake. We hope. We hope. Now, will you check and see about the temperature? How can we be sure, sir? Hmm? What do you mean? How can you know that we'll get them all? Well, that's where our observation posts and the helicopter come in. From their reports, we'll know the exact location of the locusts at all times. And if it's working. It's 70 degrees, Ed. They're probably starting to move. Emergency lab to all observation posts. Emergency lab to all observation posts. Report in. Over. Observation post number two to emergency lab. Over. Well, what is your location? Over. I'm situated in a store across from the Art Institute on Michigan Boulevard. The street is empty. Nothing in sight. Out. Observation post number three to emergency lab. I'm on the roof of the Drayton Hotel. Don't see any grasshoppers in this area, but the south side's getting some action. Out. Emergency lab to observation post one. Emergency lab to observation post one. You did not report in. What's your location, post one? Over. This is observation post number one. I'm right in the middle of them. I'm just south of 73rd and South Shore Drive. Out. Emergency lab to helicopter. Over. Helicopter to emergency lab. The locusts are active on the south side of Chicago. As yet, there are none in the downtown area. Out. Can you read me, emergency lab? Over. Yes, we can read you fine, General. Are you all set? Over. Uh, we're not quite ready yet. I think you better hold off a few more minutes. Over. I think we better start now, General. If they should change their direction and start moving away from Chicago, we may not get them all. Over. I don't like your starting until we're completely ready. This boat has to draw them away from you at a split second's notice. Over. I'd like to start, sir. Then go ahead. Sergeant. Yes, sir? Is that the wire that leads to the speaker on the roof? Yes, sir. Well, plug it into the amplifier, will you? Yes, sir. Post number one to emergency lab. The locusts are leaving this section. They're heading toward Chicago's downtown. Helicopter to emergency lab. The locusts are moving on the downtown area.
Observation post number three to emergency lab. The locusts are everywhere. They're moving toward your location. I repeat, the locusts are moving toward the emergency lab. Michigan Boulevard is filled with them. They're everywhere. Emergency lab to boat. Emergency lab to boat. It's working, General. It's working. I heard the reports. as we get clearance from observation posts. I'll check them immediately. Out. Boat to helicopter. They're still going in, sir, but it'll be a while before they all reach the downtown section. Wainwright, you'll have to hold out a bit longer. All the locusts haven't reached the downtown area yet. All right, we'll try. Observation post. Report. Over. Post number one. All clear, sir. Post number two. All clear, sir. Helicopter reporting. All clear, sir. Throw the switch. Responding. They're responding. They're swarming toward the water. They're climbing all over each other, going into the water. Head for shore.
And now, folks, it's time to say good night. We sincerely appreciate your patronage and hope we've succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. Good night. Thank you.